I got a thing in the mail and it's going to be amazing. I'm so excited. This, this I'm really excited about. This is a 3D printed 40K prop. And it comes in a lot of parts. Wow, it looks like it printed really, really nicely. Oh, this is this is a prop I've been eyeballing for a while now, but I haven't really pulled the trigger on anything 40K like real, but uh, this, this is gonna be neat. And it looks like, it looks like it all just keys together. like a glove. That was a good noise, I'm sure. No, 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 no. Boom. Boom. All right, I'm sure these pieces aren't important. Look at that! Look at that! Hey guys, Jay here. Welcome to Eons of Battle. One thing you might not know about me is even before I ever touched a Warhammer model, I loved building and painting things. But not teeny little miniatures, big ol' props. I would build all of the cool stuff from the books, movies, games, and anything else I enjoyed. I even had a little commission business in high school where I would build props for people's cosplays. This love of building very naturally blossomed into a love of 40k and all tabletop wargaming. It is the final Pokemon evolution of all these skills I have developed over the years. Everything I have ever done has led me to painting my armies. Now, wargaming can be a pretty all-consuming hobby. If you like most or all the aspects of wargaming, it can pretty quickly devour all of your free time. And you spend your evenings painting, or building, or modeling, or list building, or watching 40k content online like Eons of Battle, or displaying, or organizing. Sometimes it's fun to set that all aside and take a few steps away from the hobby. Alright, I suppose this is pretty hobby adjacent, but you get the idea. Recently, I've gotten the itch that only building something real, something in one-to-one -one scale, can resolve. So, I got this 3D print. This is a pistol inspired by the 40k universe. It was designed, as best I can tell, by an artist named Daniel Retanent, who goes by the professional handle Teptac Studios, and his creation makes for a wonderful addition to the 40k world. I'm pretty familiar with the War Gear of 40k because I have this book. Warhammer 40k War Gear. This book was from back in 2nd edition, when 40k was much more of a role-playing game, unlike now where it is a perfectly balanced tournament game. These books took you through every different weapon your miniatures could carry and told you what they did. It's a pretty interesting read, and it's what got me so jazzed to make a real version of some of these unique and interesting weapons. So I'm pretty sure this fires physical projectiles, so it can't be a las gun. But I don't think that this is a stub gun either, or a stub pistol. In the second book of the Eisenhorn trilogy, good old Inquisitor Greg loses his bolt pistol that is given to him by the Dark Angels, and he replaces it with a gun called the Storm Pistol. Now, the Storm Pistol is described as a no-frills gun that holds four bolt rounds, and I feel like this could totally be that gun. This magazine is pretty small, and it doesn't look like it could possibly hold very many bullets, potentially four. And it is certainly no frills. I think that is what I'm going to build this pistol as. Gregor Eisenhorn's four-shot storm pistol. So this will be a very different video from my more normal tutorials, but you should still expect to learn loads. Probably more than in a video where I paint some unit or character model. I want to show you how I will take this 3D print and make it look exactly like it was pulled right from the world of the Warhammer 40,000 universe. For this project, I will not be needing my Da Vinci Maestro brushes or my magnifying glasses. In this project, I am building something real. And I'm gonna need some real tools. Time to get to work. This thing is pretty snazzy, but it's time to disassemble it so I can begin to make it perfect. First, I glue the two halves of the handle together, and for the entire project, super glue will be my glue of choice. I clamp the parts to get them as close as possible, and then I examined my pieces and filled any tiny holes I found, like on this gear with some Tamiya basic putty. This putty is not very strong, but I'm not using it on places that'll get a lot of wear and tear. I just want to get a good, smooth finish. It is time to start sanding, and I have a lot of tools to do this with. 
I have my old fashioned sanding sticks and nail files, but these are only gonna help me get into the nooks and crannies. These aren't gonna be able to do the majority of the sanding. For that, I have regular old sandpaper that I have glued to blocks of wood. These are gonna help me get nice flat panels. And to clean it up, I also have sanding sponges. These are square sponges with like 100 grit sandpaper glued on top. All of these different tools together are gonna help me smooth out my parts. How I sanded each part was I gave them a light sanding with my 150 grit sandpaper, doing a light sanding. As soon as the bumpy texture of the print was gone, I stopped. Large flat sections were easy to get to with regular sandpaper, but tighter spots like the inside of this site, I broke out my nail files to get in between. And for even trickier spots, I used my sanding twigs. Every part of the print got sanded like this. And that is one perfectly sanded piece. Only many, many more to go. I put in some elbow grease and sanded every single part. This took a while, but was surprisingly relaxing. I used to do this stuff all the time, and it brings me back to doing stuff in high school. It has been a long time, but I still got the skills. It did get a bit monotonous towards the end though. Eventually, I didn't even have to look. I could prep the parts for painting without even looking at them. But I just worked slowly and carefully. If I do a good job here, it'll make the next steps much easier, and I can familiarize myself with the parts and plan on how I'll paint them. Some parts like this handle had a gap that was too big to be filled with gap filler, so I filled it with baking soda and super glue. This is a good idea for areas like this handle, because when this stuff sets, it'll be even stronger than the plastic surrounding it. Oh, holy moly, so much sanding. But I've got it right where I want it in order to spray on my filler materials. Now, if you look at this, it's not completely sanded smooth. It looks pretty smooth, but you can still see a lot of layer lines, and that was on purpose. I only kind of gave every single thing a light sanding because uh, 3D prints like this, these plastic 3D prints, they're not solid. They have a pretty thin wall, and then the inside is usually filled with triangles or hexagons, exactly like a wasp's nest. So it's really, really, really strong, but this outside is just a really sh thin skin. So if I really go to town and I sand it until I have like a glass smooth finish, I'm making that little tiny wall way thinner and making the part a lot more fragile. But right now I have all of the pieces right where I want them. And so now I need to attach them to some cardboard so that I can paint them. I didn't find any cardboard, but I did find some foam core. I hacked off a square and got to work. I took some spray glue and applied this to my square, but I didn't want my parts to touch this glue. I used the spray glue so I could apply some strips of painter's tape. The painter's tape is much stickier, but unlike the spray glue, it'll not leave behind any residue on my parts. This might seem like overkill, but it'll help because the pistol has so many little parts that would be a pain in the butt to hold and spray individually. And there is all of my parts laid out very nicely and ready to be painted. And the way I'm gonna paint them is I'm gonna give them a coat of automotive black primer this is going to help my next layer stick down. And then I'm gonna give them a few coats of Bondo Gray Body Filler. This should give me a really nice plasticky skin that is going to help give me something to sand so that I can make my prints nice and smooth. After my paint was all shaken up, it was time to head out to prime. I gave everything a nice wet coat of primer. It would not be a bad idea to give the parts another look after this coat to check for any flaws you might have missed. A good coat of primer should show exactly what's underneath. Once that was dry, I switched over to my Bondo filler primer and went to town giving everything a nice coat. This dries a nice gray which helps to see detail well, and it's nice to use two different colors so that you can see how well the next coat is laying down on top of the other coat. And there are some filler primer covered parts ready for the next step. So I have all of my parts primed and they're looking pretty good. I learned a valuable lesson. Don't spray paint in direct sunlight during the hottest part of the day. The, I had this problem where the paint was landing on the model dry, but uh, I gave it a few hours to cool off and I re-spray painted everything in the shade and it turned out great. So I started this project by giving everything a nice light sanding and now I have to do it all over again. Also, this stuff is gonna be hella toxic. So I'm gonna be masking up again and I have a vacuum standing by to catch as much of the dust as I possibly can. Now that my parts had a second skin of filler primer, I did all the same steps using my 150 grit sandpaper where I could to make my panels and flat areas nice and smooth. I sanded until I hit primer. That's how I knew I had gone far enough. I used my nail files and sanding twigs where I needed to for curves and hard to reach areas and the sanding sponge did a really good job of flexing and getting into the contours which helped a lot with some of the more irregular parts. 
Luckily, whatever toxins were in this stuff, they were nice and heavy, and instead of floating away like sawdust tends to, they sat on my cutting mat waiting for me to vacuum them up. Parts like this big rectangular middle section were super easy to finish. I used my flat sanding paper to quickly blast through the primer and get it super smooth with barely any work. This sanding was not as much fun as the first parts. This stuff is nasty to work with, and if I was not trying to capture it on film, I would probably have done all this work outside. After this many hours of sanding, you start to really reevaluate the work. This thing looked pretty good just 3D printed, and it would have only taken a few minutes to finish instead of a few hours. But it'll be worth it in the end when the prop is perfect. Also, this is the final sanding, so I had to pay closer attention and remove all imperfections because after this, the parts are finished and are ready to be painted. At this stage, my parts were looking their best, and I glued the parts I could glue together. I stuck all the handle parts together with super glue because all of these parts will be painted exactly the same color. But for some parts, like the magazine and end caps, I'll be painting them separately from the body, so I just test fit them to make sure everything still fit together. And there she is, ready and waiting to be painted. This video is a bit different from our normal stuff, and if you'd like to see us experiment like this, the best way to let us do it is to support us on Patreon. If you enjoy the videos we make, you might consider becoming a member. Over there, you'll gain access to some behind the scenes, voting on what models I paint live here on YouTube, a live hobby hangout every week, and more. With that said, let's get back to painting the pistol. It's time to paint this sucker up, and to do that, I'm gonna be giving it a good old fashioned black prime with some Rust-Oleum flat black primer. Turns out this stuff is good for more than just priming your minis. I gave all the parts a nice spray of this primer. The sandable layers were technically primers too, but everything having the same undercoat will make painting easier. And speaking of paint, I knew I wanted a green and gunmetal color scheme, so I dragged myself to the local hardware store and picked out some colors I thought would look nice. This satin oregano is going to be pretty close to the military green I wanted. It's satin, not matte. I would have preferred matte, but it'll get the job done. The wild card is this metallic aluminum paint. Now, assuming it looks just like the cap, and I've bought metallic paints that do not match the cap perfectly, this is gonna look pretty darn cool. But who knows? This is also probably gonna dry glossy, which is not gonna help things, but who knows? This might be amazing. But the safer choice probably would have been a matte dark gray. But now let's paint! I sprayed every part except for the body with the aluminum paint, giving them two very thin coats. This paint gave very good coverage. Then it was time for the body, which I sprayed with my green. I thought it turned out lovely. It was really neat to see these parts come to life, now they have a bit of color. I got lucky with the aluminum paint. It could have been a disaster, but it ended up alright. Alright, it's been about one hour since I painted everything up, and the aluminum, which turned out wonderfully, is bone dry. But of course the satin is still very slightly tacky, which is just how satin and gloss paint is. A little bit annoying, it's probably going to take about two days for this to fully cure, but it's perfectly workable now, which is good because now I get to glue it all together. All right, it's the moment I've been waiting for. I'm gonna put this all together. And uh, I could, uh, there's a lot of different ideas in terms of glue. I'm gonna be using regular old super glue because I think it'll do a fine job, but I could have used E600, epoxy, um, probably not five minute epoxy, but real epoxy. But I think that this will do just fine. A lot of these connections are very, very, very big. Plenty of surface area, and really, surface area is what's going to help you out in terms of things sticking. Since my idea of this is that it's going to be like an everyday tool for whoever's carrying this, I'm not that concerned about little dings and scratches and any damage I do to the paint. Uh, all of that is just going to help me with my weathering. But if I was building like a prop for someone of royalty or something that has to be perfect, then it would start to matter how nice. And I might want to be working on top of cloth, something soft that's not gonna mar the paint job. And it would uh, matter a lot more. Sometimes when uh, you put down a ton of super glue, it takes, a, it takes a little bit longer than a couple of seconds to dry, but that's okay. Last, oh, not last piece, but last few pieces. The magazine. Ah! It's all part of the weathering process, little dings and scratches. Kaboom! Last tiny touches, the sights. They're actually gonna be in the spot to receive a tiny bit of wear and tear. You know, no matter how good a job you do, you pick all the right paints, all the right finishing products, and you never wanna drop it. 
I don't know, I don't know of what type of uh, finishing processes and materials you can use that'll withstand a drop. Really, if you want something that's gonna have to handle like full contact, you probably wanna make it out of rubber or foam. Something light that can handle some abuse. Boom. Yeah! Oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah! Ah, oh, so nice. Now I need to make it perfect right off of the factory floor so that I can weather it. But uh, I found that if you jump the gun and you go straight to weathering and then you have to add in more details, it doesn't work out. And uh, your details are not gonna have the same weathering processes that the rest of the prop has. So I'm going to be painting up this Aquila. For the Aquila, I decided to paint it gold, Vallejo liquid gold which is an alcohol-based paint that is a bit of a pain to work with, but gives amazingly shiny results. I used a very long bristle brush to help me get this paint into all the nooks and crannies of these Imperial Eagles. You can see a hint of the 3D print lines, but I'm actually okay with that. Perhaps this eagle was laser etched into the steel of the pistol. Those aren't 3D print imperfections, but real world tooling marks. I'm using this Vallejo liquid gold, which is a wonderful paint but I actually feel like it's better for this type of an application than miniature painting because it is such a humongous pain in the butt to work with. You need to thin everything with alcohol, it dries very, very quickly, it clumps and reacts with a lot of different materials, um, and it doesn't help that they use these child-proof bottles that weld themselves shut every single time, even if you're very careful. So I... Don't know if I'm gonna be restocking on this paint once I've used this up, but it does look very nice on this and it actually works beautifully through an airbrush. I also used some liquid silver on the ejector and little rivets on the body. It's surprisingly close in color to the aluminum spray paints. And there you have a storm pistol, fresh off the assembly lines. All right, it's on to the best part and that is weathering. To do that, I'm gonna be using some old rags, a foam brush, an old paint brush, and some burnt umber and black paint. I wouldn't use your Citadel or Army Painter paints for this. I needed tons of paint. I mix them together about 75% black with 25% brown and a bit of water to get it nice and workable. Then it was time to do the unthinkable, slapping this right over my lovely paint job. I lathered it up and wiped off almost everything with a rag. This will leave a hint of black paint and let it really stick in the recesses. It's a bit like what a wash paint does to a miniature weapon. I worked in small chunks, little by little, getting lots of this paint mixture into every nook and cranny. It was a pretty laborious task, but it was lots of fun. You really see the model come to life, and if you find that the rag is not pulling off the paint, it could mean that your paint needs to be thinned more, or there is a bit of texture on your part that is holding more paint than you would want. I think the satin and glossy finishes I got were actually really helpful with this. This brought me right back to high school. I did stuff like this all the time, making props and cosplay pieces, and watching Adam Savage of Mythbusters fame and his YouTube videos One Day Builds. Super fun to take a break from miniature painting. The weathering went wonderfully, as you can see, it's looking pretty schnazzy. I really, really like how it looks on all of the metal parts, but I think it's darkened the green a little bit too much. Reasonably, I think uh, that this is a, a cleaned gun. Like, they probably wipe it up with a rag when they're done shooting some Tyranid. So I'm gonna mix just a little bit of alcohol into my water, and that should soften up some of the black paint I put on, and it should wipe right off. I used my brush to put on this alcohol mixture and gave the green parts a good rubbing. This cleaned it up nicely, but still left a good amount of black paint, which really looked like oil on a real weapon. And there she is, but I don't think it's beaten up enough yet. I put a bit of bright silver on my cardboard palette and prepared to dry brush. I brushed this onto the top of the pistol to make it look like the paint has begun to wear away. I also dry brushed this on the bottom edge and around the trenches and ejector hole. And I splashed this on the Aquila too for good measure. Then I got to try out something I have been dying to do forever. Paint chipping with a silver sharpie. I can report it works wonderfully, very easy and quick to do. And it looked surprisingly authentic, especially when it's on top of many other weathering effects. It's a bit of icing on the gun cake. And while I was at the hardware store, I went to their pick and pull aisle and found these brass machine screws that'll add a nice touch to the handle of the pistol. Yeah.
And there she is, the Storm Pistol, pulled directly from the desk of Inquisitor Greg. Manufactured en masse in the tech forges of Mars and filled with deadly bolt shells to bring the Emperor's wrath to the Xenos, the Heretic, and the Fiend. This project was really cool. It started as nothing, but now has become something. We have reclaimed the means of production. Some guy in Berlin, Germany designed the parts, somebody in Florida 3D printed them for me, and then I finished it all up with a few cans of spray paint from up the road. Three nerds' experience and expertise has led to one remarkable object. This pistol turned out spectacular. It wasn't terribly difficult to put together. If I could do it again, I would have used a hybrid of plastic and resin printing to make it even easier. The body, handle, and magazine were not too bad to finish with sanding, and the plastic printing means that they are very light and strong. But the front piece is very detailed, and the curves are a bit tricky. Also this top knob. These parts would have printed flawlessly with resin, and it would have made the project even easier. This project was so much fun. I hope you guys really liked it. Maybe I could do some more. Maybe I could work through all of the pistols from 40k. I could do an Eldar Shuriken pistol, a Tau Pulse pistol. A Tyranid Spine Fist would be a heck of a challenge. I'd have to teach myself how to pour silicone rubber to get it appropriately fleshy. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this. I know I enjoyed the spit out of this project. And now I have a really cool piece from the Warhammer 40,000 world that I can hold in my hands, which is really, really cool. I highly recommend you track down an STL or you get something on eBay or Etsy and give it a try. It doesn't take too much. Just a little bit of cheap acrylics and some spray paint and lots and lots of sanding. But now it's time for the real star of the show. This week's EOB completes submissions. We put out a challenge to our community to send us before and after photos of their recently finished models to be immortalized in our videos. If you want to join in the fun, you can submit a before and after photo of your painted mini to our Discord server, which you can find in the description below, or you can post it to Instagram with the hashtag EOBcomplete. Without further ado, let's look at and get inspired by what the folks have finished this week. Some Blackstone Fortress Urgles by HTL Bobalicious, a Shock Jump Dragsta by The Simon Monkey Lobotomized, a Custom Commissar by Yamawaki, a Grey Knight Terminator by Commander Cadre, a Custom Praetorian by Just Make Stuff, some Tower Breachers by Ao O'Main, a Spooky Jack o' Lantern and Pumpkins by Alex Ryder123, a Custom Necron Overlord by Sir Smashy, some Orkillicans by Ryoganox, a Tyranid Trigon by Grim Celestia, a Dwarf or Halfling Archer by The Brave, some Orc Knobs by Big Lez, some Cruel Boy Archers by JFK Space Race, some Nurgle Poxwalkers by MickGZ65, a Custom Space Marine Lieutenant by by Trent, a Stormcast Eternal by Ender Skepperen, a Grassy Landscape by Frozen Throg, a Blade Guard Veteran by Tyrius, an Orc with Banna by Arnold DeGans, some Custom Tau Drones by David King, a Retro 40k Amble by RL Karn 95, a Spire Stalker by Disco, an Intercessor Space Marine by Dancing of Doom, some Space Marine Aggressors by TNT Gaming 285, and some Chaos Rubric Marines by CJ Boy. Congratulations to everyone for a job well done. It's no small feat to get paint on minis and you all should feel really proud. Nothing gets the hobby juices flowing like finishing a project and we all thank you for sharing your work, motivating us and the hobby community to paint our plastic. Thanks for sharing.